Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks for coming to this, the Agnes Heller Lecture, which is in the uh, series of the Dean's Lectures. The purpose behind which are to, uh, I suppose, celebrate uh, various research and teaching strengths within the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and uh, sociology has certainly been a discipline with a tremendous history and a, I think a, an even greater future. And it's, uh, I suppose, a celebration of Agnes Heller's uh, contribution to that that uh, we're gathered here today. So without further ado, uh, John Carroll will uh, introduce the speaker. Thank you. It's a special pleasure for me to welcome Peter to deliver. This is the seventh, according to my count, and Agnes Heller annual sociology lecture. Peter is Professor of Creative Arts and Social Aesthetics at James Cook University. I should point out, and you'll probably get some sense of why, Peter is extremely nomadic. Peter takes us straight into the territory of tradition and the significance of lineage and tradition. And this is, I think, particularly important to La Trobe sociology's sense of itself. Um, he was a student at La Trobe. He was a PhD student supervised by Agnes Heller in her period, well, she was at La Trobe from 1977 till 1985, seven or eight years. It was in the latter phases of that period that Peter was, came under Agnes's supervision. So we've got that link. Peter has also stayed very close to Agnes and refers to her work, particularly recent work, in his, throughout his work and also particularly in his um, recent works. In terms of lineage, Agnes Heller was, came from Hungary. She was a member of the Budapest School, a very famous intellectual group centred around George Lukács. Um, Agnes was widely regarded as the leading disciple or follower of George Lukács. Lukács himself, probably the most significant Marxist of the 20, intellectual Marxist of the 20th century. I think in the context of sociology, um, a more significant link for, for us at least is that he was fairly close, as a young man, he was very close to Max Weber and he regularly attended Max Weber's Sunday afternoons in Heidelberg and Max Weber had a very high opinion of the brilliant young uh, George Lukács. And for those of you who are interested in these things, he's probably the, the, the basis for one of the main characters in Thomas Mann's novel, uh, The Magic Mountain. That's George Lukács. So Peter and Agnes give us a direct link back to arguably the most important of the founding fathers of sociology. And I think it's um, important for us at La Trobe to um, highlight and cherish um, this particular lineage. Peter Murphy's written a number of books, um, especially on cities, creativity, innovation. Um, I'd particularly recommend his latest from a year ago called The Collective Imagination. Uh, it's a brilliant book on innovation and creativity in the social context um, today. And I think it'll be partly in relationship to that book that he'll be addressing us uh, this evening. So without further ado, let me, with great thanks, welcome. Peter Murphy. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, John. Um, I began thinking about the problems that I'm going to talk about tonight when I was uh, a PhD student, which is now quite a long time ago. And um, without question, uh, one of the great intellectual experiences of my life uh, was the, the opportunity to work uh, with and under um, Agnes uh, for, for those years. And um, uh, it has been a, um, a constantly invigorating point of reference in throughout my intellectual career. And uh, Agnes, in fact, puts in an appearance in one of the, the slides tonight, so we can look forward to that. Um, and uh, I have been thinking about uh, the problems uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight for um, the last uh, 30 years uh, or more. Um, 
I first began thinking about them in, with a different frame of mind. Um, tonight I'm going to, I guess, um, express a certain degree of intellectual pessimism. Uh, there was a time when in all of these matters to do with the uh, intellectual creativity of the time, which is basically what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, my view was one of, of optimism and uh, I took um, often vigorous exception uh, to um, other views um, of, of the kind that I'm going to express tonight 30 years ago. In between time, I have changed my mind, as you can see, and, um, uh, well, I'll let the, the, um, the paper tonight speak for itself. The rate of creativity in OECD countries is in decline and has been for a long time. A pronounced downturn began in the 1970s and closely tracks the rise of, the rise of mass higher education. A notable sharp downward turning point occurs around 1974. This is when the post-industrial, post-modern era commenced. While the rhetoric of the knowledge society encountered an age of supposed intense creation, the actual record of the period was tepid. The Mass University was the signature institution of the postmodern, post-industrial era. The singular failure of the era was the failure of that institution. It promised much, but delivered little. Universities relentlessly expanded after 1970 in number and size. They employed ever more academic staff, which meant ever more presumptive researchers. The same was true of large corporations with R&D departments and dedicated government scientific research institutions. In 1950, the number of scientists and engineers engaged in research and development uh, in the United States was one quarter of 1% of the workforce. By 1993, that figure had risen threefold to more than three quarters of a percent. Yet the rise in unique discovery in the period was not threefold, far from it. The Stanford economist, Charles I. Jones, in 2000, put it rather delicately when he said, quote, if we double the number of researchers looking for ideas at a point in time, we may less than double the number of unique discoveries. Indeed so. After 1970, OECD countries spent a large amount of money on research and yet achieved only a minimal amount of advancement in the arts and sciences. The Australian case is typical. From 1993 to 2010, the amount Australia spent on the external funding of university research uh, rose from 751 million to over 3 billion, all amounts in 2010 dollars, a fourfold real increase. In the same period, the output of research journal articles grew from 21,000 to 33,000, a 1.6 fold increase. Note the differential. The size and return on investment in medical research is both revealing and typical of the dead end of postmodern creation. In 1947, the United States government established the National Institutes of Health funding body. In that year, its budget was $8 million. In the 2009 fiscal year, its budget was $29.5 billion. In real terms, accounting for population growth and inflation, American federal government spending on medical research has grown 237 times in the intervening period. Did breakthrough discoveries multiply by a factor of 237? No. What about by a factor of just 23? No. Cost rise in the biotechnology sector not least because the cost of developing new drugs rises, not least because research costs rise. Yet what results do we get from all of that investment? 
The answer is surprisingly little anymore. Charlton and Andrus in 2005 and Vertman and Betica in 1995 uh, observe that the big developments in biomedical science took place between 1935 and 1965, with key advances occurring in antibiotics, glucocorticoid steroids, hormone replacement therapies, psychiatric drugs, surgical technique, anaesthetics and DNA. The rate of major clinical advances since has declined. Developments in cancer therapy, psychiatric drugs and new antibiotics have slowed to an incremental pace that is marked by a marginal benefit increase, often severe side effects and very expensive clinical trialling. An auspicious mid-20th century period of biomedical science was followed by a marked increase in human life expectancy for those born between 1960 and 1980. Female life expectancy at birth in Australia in 1901 was 58. In 1980, it was 78. Over an 80-year span, life expectancy increased 20 years. By 2006, life expectancy had increased a further five years to 83. While it had increased, the rate of increase slowed from a one-year increase every four years to a one-year increase every five years. At the same time, real levels of funding for medical research had catapulted in the period. By the 2000s, funding in real terms vastly exceeded by many orders of magnitude that of the propitious 1930 to 1960 era of medical science, the era of Howard Florey and Frank McFarlane Burnett. Yet scientific outcomes were visibly on the wane. In a more general sense, in the post-industrial era, the measure of scientific success shifted from outcomes to inputs. The more money secured for research, the more successful the research was, accepting that it wasn't. The postmodern era was an age of proxies, every imaginable substitute for the real thing. From peer review to citations to research income served as a meagre replacement for actual discovery. Instead of measuring discovery, the many bureaucracies of the mass university system measured anything but discovery in a futile attempt either to avert or to ignore the underlying decline in breakthroughs, the nub of discovery. Thus, while cancer treatments to continued to improve incrementally, Definitive th therapies or vaccines remained elusive, as did a unified theory of the cause of cancer. The gene associated with the Huntington's degenerative neurological order was discovered in 1993. Yet a cure for the Huntington's malady remained stubbornly out of sight. William Rutter and colleagues at the University of California in San Francisco isolated the gene for insulin in 1977, this allowed the mass production of genetically engineered insulin. Yet both the cause and cure of diabetes continued to elude researchers. Retrovi retroviruses were connected to the HIV AIDS condition in the early 1980s. And life extending antiviral suppressant therapies emerged quickly thereafter. And yet no vaccine for the condition has been discovered despite the large investment in research in the area. It's important to point out that it's not only government investment in ideas that has been to a significant degree fruitless. The same has been true of industry. Consider journalist Michael Mandel's 2009 observation about the multitude of promises that were made in the late 1990s about the then coming biomedical and other revolutions. The world was assured of breakthrough cancer treatments, gene therapies, stem cell therapies, tissue engineering, high-speed satellite internet, cars powered by fuel cells, micro-machines on chips and so on. What happened to such products, Mendel asked. A decade on, he noted that no gene therapy had been approved for sale in the United States. Rural dwellers could get satellite internet, but the service was far slower than what had been promised. 
The terrible economics of alternative energy had not changed much in a decade, and while the biotechnology industry had produced some important drugs, such as the cancer drugs Avastin and Gleevec, Mandel reflected that the gains in healthcare had been disappointing compared with the sums invested in research. Indeed, they have. Nightingale and Martin in 2004 noted that between 1980 and 2003, there had been a sevenfold increase in patents, but a tenfold increase in research and development spending in the pharmaceutical industry. The number of drugs approved by the US Food and Drug Administration in the same period increased through to the mid-1990s and then sharply decreased to 2003. The authors noted that this performance was even worse when we consider the 8 to 12 year time lag between research and product release and then compare that with the substantial increase in R&D expenditure between 1970 and 1993. Dorsey and colleagues in 2010 concluded the same. Uh, private and public funding of drug research in the US doubled in real terms between 1994 and 2003 but the number of new drug approvals by the US and Food Administration declined. The decline continued through to 2008. The more that was spent, the less was produced. Despite huge investments, Nightingale and Martin observed that only 16 biopharmaceuticals evaluated between 1986 and 2004 showed more than minimal improvement over existing treatments. From the 1980s going forward, recompetent DNA techniques were widely touted, yet as of 2003, they were responsible for only a handful of successful new drugs. There were six major breakthroughs per decade in biomedicine in the 1940s, 1950s and 1960s. Lafourne in 1999 calculated that the rate of major discovery dropped to three per decade in the period from 1970 to 1998. The US Food and Drug Administration approved 2,891 new drugs in the 1950s and 964 in the decade of the 2000s. The number of new molecular entities approved for drug use in the United States in the 2000s was barely more than that in the 1950s. The Economist magazine in a 2005 report made an interesting point. The modern pharmaceutical industry began with the rediscovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming in 1928 and the development of its use as a medicine by the aforementioned Australian Harold Florey, the German Ernst Chain and the Englishman Norman Heatley. What is notable is that between 1930 and 1970, drug research operated on the basis of serendipity and it was successful. Come 1970, the ethos changes. The biotechnology model of rational drug design, high throughput screening and genetic engineering takes over. Big things were expected of this. The result, though, was that only little things happened. It seems, after all, that the serendipity of the investigator cannot be replaced. The word serendipity, in case you're interested, was coined by the English man of letters and Whig politician Horace Walpole in 1754, writing to Horace Mann. Walpole devised the term after the heroes of the Persian fairy tale, the three princes of Serendip, who, quote, were always making discoveries by accidents and sagacity of things they were not in quest of, end quote. Walpole's word points to the tangential, offbeat nature of discovery that no systematic or institutionalised process can replicate. Now, to this point, I've talked at some length about my biomedical research for one simple reason. Its outcomes, or lack of outcomes, like those of technology, are clear cut. We either treat or cure conditions, or we don't. In the short term, the outcomes of the creative arts, 
humanities and social sciences are less clear cut and more contestable. If I say that these are in decline today, you will say that they are not. So I am going to say something else. I'm going to say that medical discovery and technology discovery are in decline and that these are also the signs of a much more widespread waning. Consider then the field of the creative arts. In the visual arts, <clears throat> the period between 1890 and 1970, that is between Cezanne and Rothko, was outstanding. What followed was dismal. Almost any postmodern work, it is between 1970 and 2000, was forgettable, bar a handful. Exceptions like Gerhard Richter or the late period David Hockney unfortunately only proved the rule. Contemporary post-2000 digital media artworks are occasionally interesting, yet as their ambivalent name suggests, they lack the kind of strong conceptual identity that marked the modernist era in art. Since the end of the modernist period, art has been dominated either by kitsch concepts or by weak concepts. The judgment of time on postmodern art has been, very has been very severe. A Don Thompson in 2008 calculated that of the 1,000 artists <coughs> with major gallery shows in London and New York in the 1980s, only 20 of those artists were offered in evening auctions in Christie's or Sotheby's in 2007. Art without traction, art that's not memorable, art without longevity is not art. The contemporary creative deficit applies just as much to popular marketed artworks as it does to elite gallery artworks. Rolling Stone magazine's 2012 music industry poll of the top 500 music albums lists 11 works from the 1950s 105 from the 1960s, 187 from the 1970s, 82 from the 1980s, 75 from the 1990s, 38 from the 2000s, and two from the truncated 2010s. This collective judgment and the arc of creation it reveals is an accurate one. More interesting still are the figures from the 1970s. Technically, the creative output of the 1970s exceeds that of the 1960s, excepting that. When one drills down into the figures, what is revealed is that 50% of the best 1970s albums came from the first four years of the decade, the years 1970 to 1973. And immediately after that point, there is a sharp drop-off in first-class output. The distinct downward shift after 1973 pinpoints the general problem of creation in the last 40 years. Now, at the very moment when the multiple decades long postmodern creative recession began in the 1970s, the philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis observed that the social impetus to discovery had begun to wane radically. At the time, he was virtually alone in noting this. The postmodern decades were filled with creative boosters, often of a very pretentious kind. Today, Castoriadis's then rather lonely observation has been elegantly confirmed by Dean Keith Simonton. Simonton is Professor of Psychology at the University of California at Davis. He spent four years writing about creativity. In 2013, that is this year, in January this year, in the journal Nature, he bluntly stated that the kind of scientific originality that characterised the eras of Michelson and Morley or Einstein had abated. Imaginative leaps today have become much rarer. Domain-specific expertise now dominates science, and while scientific knowledge still advances, it does so on the whole without expanding the deep-set foundations of knowledge. Well, that does beg the question. Why is this so? I think there are a number of levels of explanation of this phenomenon. 
at the highest level, it is a socio-cultural problem that has very long historical roots. At the most elementary level, the micro workings of our research institutions, or should I say, by contrast with the socio-cultural long history, and at the most elementary level, at the micro workings of our research institutions, these institutions are filled with countless unhelpful traits. A commonplace example which I will mention in passing is the habit we have of substituting for discovery misleading proxies like citation counts and impact factors. I'm not going to pursue further a discussion tonight either of the macro level, the big picture socio-cultural historical dynamics nor am I going to discuss the micro level of research. Those discussions are for another day. Rather, I want to turn to the meso level of the problem. The meso level lies between the minute institutional mechanics of research and the very big picture of long-term socio-cultural dynamics. Each level influences the other, but each is analytically separate or separable from the other. Uh, what is most interesting at the meso level um, of analysis is the problem of scale over time. That is how big or small institutions of discovery are, how the evolution of their size over time has impacted research and how big or small they should be in principle. In this paper today, the main thing that I want to suggest is that the arts, the sciences and the universities have grown too large. The bigger that these creative sectors have become, the more they have expanded beyond an optimal point, the lower the incidence of per capita creativity has become, and the more that the rate of unique discovery in the arts and sciences has slowed. A way of better understanding this is to revisit the instructive work of Derek Price. Price was a physicist and a historian of science. He was one of the founders, along with Alfred Lotka, of the field of bi bibliometrics. In 1963, Price identified a key statistical pattern of research publishing. This is Price's square root law of research. To fully understand the significance of Price's square root law, some additional background is first necessary. The origin of Price's law goes back to the pioneering paper by Alfred Lotka in 1926 on the frequency distribution of scientific productivity. In that paper, Lotka examined a large sample of scientific publication data. The bulk of Lotka's data came from the 1907 to 1916 series of chemical abstracts. This encompassed 6,981 contributors to the chemistry research literature who had produced some 22,939 research records. Lotka's sample was the entries under the letters A and B of the chemical abstracts. The key thing that Lotka identified was the highly skewed distribution of research output. Simply put, a very large amount of research is produced by a small number of researchers, while a large number of researchers produce a small amount, a small amount of output each. If we revisit Lotka's original chemical abstracts data, what that reveals is an average output per person per annum of 0.33 items, a third of an item per year. In contrast, the average output for the top 10% most frequent contributors is 1.68 items per person per annum. The top 1% produced five items per person per annum, the top 2% produced four items per person per annum. The bottom 50% bottom of authors contributed one item in a decade and 70% of the total output. 
The top 25% of most frequent authors contributed 73% of the total. Wayne Dennis confirmed this pattern of output. He found a similar skewed distribution in a 1955 study. Lotka noted other patterns in the data that he'd collected. In particular, he observed that the number of persons making two contributions to the research literature was about one-fourth, that is, one divided by two squared, of those making one contribution. Those making three contributions of it was about one-ninth, that is, one divided by three squared of those making one contribution, and so on. Those who made 100 contributions were about one ten thousandth, that is, one divided by 100 squared, as common as the single contributor. Locke offered a law of research output in the light of this observed pattern. That is, the number making n contributions is one divided by n squared, those making one contribution. Derek Price subsequently reformulated Lotka's law. Price proposed that if there are n numbers of scholars in a field, then the square root of n will produce 50% of papers in the field. Thus, for example, if there are 100 scholars in a field, then 10 of them will produce 50% of the papers in the field. If there are 1,000, then 31 will produce 50% of the papers and so on. Dean Keith Simonton later noted that Price's law was a simpler, yet cruder, and thus less accurate measure of predicted output than Lotka's. However, Price's starting point was different from Lotka's. Price wanted to answer the motif of Lotka's paper. It would be of interest, Lotka had declared, to determine, if possible, the part which men of different calibre contribute to the progress of science." End quote. This is what Price pursued. The question of research productivity was important, but secondary to the question of research calibre. That said, Price and others, including Simonton, concluded that productivity and calibre were, ne- were nevertheless strongly correlated. High calibre researchers tend to be very productive, even if the converse cannot be guaranteed, namely that a highly productive researcher is of high calibre. Either way, the number of productive researchers and the number of eminent researchers is small. What Price defined was a law of calibre. Uh, Price proposed that the total number of scientists is the square of the number of good ones, or conversely, the number of stellar contributors to a field is the square root of the total number of contributors to the field. Now, the implications of Price's law are significant. It means, in essence, that good science is small science. And this is true as much for the arts as it is for the sciences. And for the creative arts, it is doubly true. Even more so than the scientists, and than the sciences, rather, a, a very tiny number of highly productive creators dominate the visual and performing arts. Employing more researchers or creators cannot reverse the law of small numbers. If anything, it intensifies it. In 1963, Price observed that the time it was taking for the number of scientists to double was three times faster than the time it was taking for the general population to double. More than anything, this fostered the delusions of the postmodern age about its own cognitive capacity. The problem with this hyper rate of growth of science personnel, impressive as it sounds, is that the number of eminent contributors to a field over time cannot grow faster than the rate of population growth. This means that if a field is growing faster for a long time than the general population is, then the larger the field gets, the poorer the field becomes. The same applies to the arts and sciences as a whole. Price made the imperishable point. Increasing the number of researchers may increase the number of research papers, but it will not increase the number of distinguished papers. The number of persons who create work that is exceptional, distinguished, accomplished or noteworthy remains a constant proportion of the larger population. Growing the number of scientists or artists faster than the growth of the general population does not change that fact. 
This is because, as Price also observed, while every, every doubling of the population had produced at least three doublings of the number of scientists as far back as the 17th century, the number of entries in dictionaries of national biography over time remained a constant proportion of the population. In 1874, Francis Galton calculated that one in 20,000 of the general population is an eminent person, and one in 100,000 of the general population is an eminent scientist. If we include the social sciences, humanities and creative arts, that latter figure becomes one in 75,000 persons. Price noted that the starred names in J. McKean Cattell's 1903 to 1960 biographical dictionary, American Men of Science, made up a proportion of the population similar to that which Galton had calculated. In the 50 years prior to 1963, the numbers of American scientists grew 16-fold, doubling every 12.5 years. The American population in those 50 years grew twofold, from 92 million to 179 million. Now, the post-industrial era replicate, replicated this growth differential on a mass scale. For example, from 1989 to 2009, full-time faculty in American degree-granting institutions expanded from 524,000 to 700 and, uh, sorry, yeah, 524,000 to 728,000. <clears throat> a 0.4 increase, while the general US population grew from 246 million to 307 million, a 0.2 increase, um, half of the rate of the faculty increase. Simply put, the illusion of the knowledge society was that we could multiply discoverers faster than the general population and its constant fraction of inventive souls. This is just not possible to do. In fact, at the level of disciplines, the obverse is true. That is to say, more is less. Consider the case of economics. I'm very even-handed in my spread of disciplines here. In the 1930s and 1940s, it was, that is to say, economics rather, was an intellectually powerful discipline. It was distinguished uh, by figures like Schumpeter, Hayek and Keynes. One of them, Hayek, even predicted the onset of the Great Depression. He was almost alone among economists in doing so. Consider then the effects of time and size. The American Economic Association, the AEA, had 572 members in 1893. 2,621 members in 1936 and 16,944 members in 2009. Using Price's law, that gross membership translates to 23, 51 and 118 outstanding contributors, respectively. It is little wonder then that in 2008-2009, in response to the global financial crisis, most of the American and international economics profession endorsed Keynesian pump priming government spending techniques that in the past had repeatedly failed. These techniques had almost zero effect in reversing the world's economic downturn. The economic advisers to the Obama administration predicted that as a result of its supersized $831 billion stimulus spending package in 2009, the unemployment rate in the third quarter of 2013 would be 5%. In the second quarter of 2013, it was still 7.5%. In June 2013, the American economy had 2 million fewer jobs than it did in January 2008. What is it at issue here is not simply predictive failure, though, predictive failure, though the predictive failure is serious. What is also at issue is the near unanimous support of economists for theories that spawn wrong predictions. Unanimity points to intellectual conformity, hardly the animating spirit of discussion, discovery rather. 
Underlying this is the monoculture of a discipline grown too large and the accompanying failure of imagination. The discipline's monoculture is reflected in the voting and political preferences of American economists. For example, Klein and Stern in 2007 surveyed AEA economists. The researchers reported that very few, 3% only, of 264 survey respondents held strong free market views. Most either lent towards or supported government activism. The Democrat to Republican voting ratio of American economists is 2.5 to 1. There is nothing surprising in those figures. We all know the reality. With the rise of the mass university came political homogeneity followed by intellectual homogeneity. Even though one might have expected the growth in the size of the university sector to have increased intellectual diversity, the converse happened. The consequence is that when poor predictions occur, as they will, there are now very few faculty left proposing alternative theories that offer different predictions. Declining predictive power is a sign of sciences that are in trouble. So also is the rapid obsolescence and outright invalidity of knowledge. It is well established that the postmodern era had a problem with truth. Truth implies that knowledge is accurate, sound and reliable. Yet much of what presents as knowledge today is none of those things. In 2002, Thierry Poignard and his co-researchers and the expert reviewers they called in looked at almost 500 articles on the, on the liver diseases, cirrhosis and hepatitis, published between 1945 and 1999 in the journals Gastroenterology and The Lancet. What they found was that 60% um, of, of conclusions were still considered to be true, 19% were obsolete, and 21% were false. Derek Price had observed that truth had a half-life. The half-life of truth is a point at which 50% of the published research on a subject is either out of date or wrong. Poynard and colleagues concluded that the half-life of truth at the half-life of the truth of the research that they examined was 45 years. That is not really very long. Following Price's lead, Samuel Arbusman in 2012 nicknamed this the half-life of facts. Obsolete knowledge is unavoidable to a point. But how much obsolescence and what speed of obsolescence and how much accumulated false knowledge can be borne by science or social science before its credibility is shot? The advancement of knowledge ought not to be confused with the progress of knowledge. Knowledge advances when additional true knowledge is discovered and secured. In contrast, knowledge progresses by the belated discovery of falsehood and the consequent disposal of it. The latter gives us short discipline half-lives. This is a lot less compelling than the accumulation of durable knowledge. Related to the fascination with falsification is the desire to dispense with truth as a sceptical check on claims to knowledge. Consequently, to name many fake facts and spurious explanations flourish. One reason for this is that invalid findings of scientific studies are accepted as valid at the time they are produced because no one bothers to test or double check them. Science says, or the study reports, has become the effective pseudo-validation of knowledge. Eventually, such findings are falsified, but by other studies years later. In between time, billions in public spending can rest on specious science. This is Especially so when the postmodern age increased the propensity of authors to make statements like science tells us or the science is settled. In doing so, the public posture of science has moved from the sceptical to the authoritarian. The past 40 years has seen a significant decline in the arts and sciences. This is directly and indirectly the predicted effect of the operation of Price's law. In 1963, Price forecast the eventual entropy of all intellectual fields in the sciences due to the spiritual dominance of each field's periphery. 
What he predicted for the natural sciences is equally true of the social sciences, the creative arts and the humanities. As a field grows rapidly or exponentially for a time, its long tail and its shallow margins eventually overshadow and delate the strong yet always tiny core. Nominally, knowledge may be produced in greater quantities, yet this occurs with diminishing intellectual returns. As a field grows, knowledge is stripped of imagination. Emphasis tacitly falls on dissemination in place of creation. Knowledge becomes characterised incrementally by ever larger portions of tepidness, ineffectuality and inhibition. In such a context, fewer and fewer great works are incubated. The ecology of dissemination is different from the ecology of creation. The larger the field grows, the larger becomes the gap in numbers between core and peripheral contributors. Dissemination, interpretation and spreading the word are crucial to inquiry. Researchers need readers. Yet there is a point at which dissemination feeds back into the discovery core and corrodes it. Intellectual fields are like supernova stars. Beyond a certain point, their growth is a prelude to entropy and eventual extinction. These fields burn their creative fuel, they die out. This is what is happening to contemporary research. Derek Price, uh, in 1963 and 1965, calculated that between 1650 and 1950, the number of records in science journals grew at a rate of 4.5% and doubled every 10 to 15 years. Examining the evidence for the period between uh, 1907 and 2007, Larson and Inns in 2010, calculate that in the aggregate, the rate of doubling has been subsequently maintained. Yet, beneath that headline number, a much bleaker picture emerges, with the rate of growth of core science disciplines now declining sharply. The headline figure, in fact, is only secured by compensating growth in the applied science disciplines of medicine, computer and electronic engineering and technology. And these, we have seen, are displaying their own evident weaknesses. At the same time, the core sciences, mathematics, physics and chemistry, have been sharply declining since 1974, with doubling times increasing to the 20 and 30 year scale. If the core sciences look bad, then consider the state of the social sciences. The growth rate for the social science citation index for the period 1987 to 2006 was 1.6% per year for all records and 2% per year for journal articles. The, the corresponding doubling times were 44 and 37 years. Essentially, the social sciences are dying. Mathematics, chemistry and physics are not far behind. Data from the Google Ngram word and phrase search in the Google Books database of 5.2 million books published between 1500 and 2008 containing 500 billion words reveals a similar picture. Use of the terms mathematics, physics and chemistry declines after 1964, biology after 2000, engineering after 1990, computer science also after 1990. The incidence of biotechnology and information technology words flatlines in the decade of the 2000s. Biomedicine is a rare word cluster that continues to grow. Obviously, its funding is continuing to grow. The terms social science, sociology and political science decline after 1970, and economics does so after 1990. Interestingly, philosophy, history and literature as well as art and architecture, sit on a two-century plateau, not growing, yet not declining. One of the reasons for this is that after 1970, the creative arts and the humanities did not share in the postmodern knowledge industry boom. They shrank in size relative to health and technology and the business and social sciences. Being a minnow in a sea of big sharks has its dangers, but also its virtues. For when the fall comes, as it must eventually, the small fry have a much shorter distance to drop. Nature abhors a vacuum, and so 
it appears to the arts and the sciences. This means as major areas of research have declined or flatlined, marginal areas have risen up. Since the 1970s, references to subsidiary and secondary, peripheral and fringe forms of inquiry have grown. This is a reminder that the era, the era of the knowledge society produced endless reams of spurious, negligible and borderline knowledge. The prophet of the age was undoubtedly Paul Freibund. His 1975 work against method was a primer on the epistemology of anything goes. And here you'll see up on the slides are some of the examples of what went. Once created, fields of inquiry grow and often grow rapidly. But beyond a certain point, growth switches from being a positive to a negative. Success becomes a kind of failure. A model for visualising this is inception, contagion, saturation. At its inception, a field is small and highly charged. Beyond a certain threshold, as numbers of practitioners multiply, a contagion starts. The more practitioners, the more contact between practitioners, the more the contagion spreads. A mark of contagion is rapid growth. The rapid growth, though, eventually slows. It ends in saturation. Derek Price proposed that when graphed, the pattern of takeover, explosive growth and saturation looks like a logistic curve, an SJ symmetrical sigmoid curve. Price also estimated that explosive growth would occur for five to six periods of rapid doubling before slackening off. Accordingly, how long does it take a major intellectual field to go from the first point of acceleration to saturation? If we assume an average of 5.8 periods of rapid doubling before saturation and 12 years is the average time span for rapid doubling to occur, then the average time span of a discipline from acceleration to saturation is 70 years. The history of intellectual discovery looks a lot like a series of interlocking logistic curves such that the inception of one adventive field coincides with the saturation of another one. This, by the way, resembles the pattern of Kondratiev waves of economic growth in industrial society since the late 18th century. Both display overlapping curves of saturation inception. Modernity is not progressive. It is, cyc- it is cyclical. It rises and falls, rises and falls. Being today at the bottom of a cycle should mean that things will get better. Maybe science will begin to produce more true knowledge. However, the real longitudinal problem is the possibility that each upswing of modernity's pendulum is less powerful than the previous one. What if modernity is suffering from a subtle form of entropy? Let me try and answer that question in conclusion. Growth is an unambiguous plus in modern economies. Growth in major economies in the past past two centuries has been unprecedented. There is nothing else like it in human history. One of the reasons this has happened is that major growth economies were successful at translating science into industry technology and social science into industry organisation. But in the post-industrial era, economic growth rates in the major established economies began to drop. Indicators give a strong hint that as the underlying real rate of discovery and creativity has declined, so has long-term economic growth. The irony of this is that it is likely that economic growth has been stymied by the growth of science. This is because while growth is an unalloyed positive for economies, beyond an optimal point, and possibly a very modest optimal point, growth is a negative for culture and science. This is the paradox of intellectual productivity The larger the science, the less we create. The bigger the field, the fewer 
are the works of lasting importance. The more money we spend on research, the less we get in real terms in return for that expenditure. The historical record is strongly suggestive that this is true. Even though numbers in the arts and sciences outstrip population growth from the 1450s onwards, the number of scientists and artists in the population still remained tiny relative to the population until the 20th century. Even, in the 19th, even if 19th century bohemians had an exaggerated opinion of themselves, no one talked about a creative class in their time. There was no creative economy for officials and commissions to collect statistics about. Discoveries in medical science and technology in the period 1935 to 196 are notable. Nevertheless, most of the landmark, landmark achievements in the arts and sciences occur before this, and long before the 20th century. The peak of creative work in the core natural sciences occurs at the end of the 18th century and in the early 19th century. In mathematics, it is the late 16th and the 17th century. In medicine, the 19th century. In technology, the key period is from the mid-18th century to the mid-19th century. In Western philosophy, the latter part of the 17th century and the latter part of the 18th century. In Western art, it has joined the 15th, early 16th and first half of the, century, uh, the 17th centuries. Go to Italy, have a look at that. Western literature crests at the end of the 16th century and in the 19th century. And Western art music in the mid-16th, early 17th and early 18th century. All of this work involved tiny numbers of practitioners operating in small milieus. We have reversed this. We have created large institutions and a large number of practitioners and we have ended up with comparatively minuscule results. This does not mean we get no significant results, but we do get relatively far fewer of them. Simply put, Big science does not work. Big social science does not work. The big humanities and the big arts do not work. Above all, big universities and big university sectors do not work. The big university works no more than big government does. Indeed, the former is simply an extension of the latter. The power of tiny numbers is a recurrent feature of outstanding culture and science. But what exactly do I mean? I big or small? How big is big and how small is small? Well, in concluding, I shall put a very precise number on this. The university sector in advanced countries should be half the size it is today. As previously noted, Francis Galton calculated that the number of eminent scientists in the population was one in 100,000 persons. If we add social, culture and creative fields, that scales to one in 75,000 persons. We can extrapolate from that. Universities have eminent, distinguished and talented faculty. Let us further assume that one in 75 faculty is eminent, six in 75 is distinguished and the others, 68 in 75, are talented. Now, let's take the case of Australia. Its population in 2009 was 21 million. Uh, that predicts 280 eminent academics and an academic population of 21,000. In actuality, Australia had 45,000 full-time academic staff in 2009, about twice as many as the model would predict. Thank you, everyone. After such a <clears throat> chastening and interesting talk, I think we should allow five or so minutes for comments or questions. You're receptive? I'm receptive. You Good. can go and tell me how wrong I am. Peter, Peter is a non-conformist um, researcher academic, as you might have uh, intuited. Any questions, comments? Yeah, uh, this is not an interrogation. Um, there was a comment once by Bill Gates when he was asked what keeps him up at night? And he says, it's not Apple, it's not uh, Amazon, it's the guy in the garage. Do you see any hope for the, the guys in the garage outside the university to uh, increase cre creativity? 
when you think of something like Google, which was actually invented by two people, um, is, that, is that perhaps a, a, an optimistic way of looking at things? Y yes. Is that on? I can't hear. OK, that's on. You can never hear behind the microphone here. Um, that's a very interesting question. I, I constantly think about that question. I don't have a definitive answer for it. I, I recommend everyone go and see the Steve Jobs movie, by the way. Um, that's quite illustrative, I think, of the of the questions underlying it. There's there's nice vignettes of him as a as a dropout at Reed College, um, and in fact, in in the history of intellectual wherewithal, one of the most important cohorts of the people who went to university and dropped out of university to go on and do much more interesting, exciting things. Um, so yes, but one of the things that struck me watching the movie, I was watching it on the plane. It's so when I get to catch, check, check up with, check, catch up with the movies. And again, um, you know, everybody will say that the, one of the high points of the, uh, the post-industrial period was Silicon Valley. This is true, of course, but Silicon Valley these days is pretty much brain dead. And one of the things that struck me watching the movie last night was, of course, the really creative period of the valley is a long time ago now. And, um, however, to answer your question more directly, um, I, think, I think I answered in two ways. One is that um, the history of creation is, is the history of creative uh, uh, times and places, and those times and places do move on. Um, so that, and, and of course, once, you know, once a place becomes creative, it, it, it really recaptures that original moment of creation. But there are some interesting exceptions to it, like London is a case of a place that's managed to have creative peaks several times. Um, I think the, the metaphor of the garage is interesting in the sense that it's quite clear to me that... Um, the, the informal milieu is extremely important to this. And it, there are clearly times and places where informal milieus uh, proliferate. And again, this comes out very effectively in the Jobs movie. There's a homebrew club and all of those kinds of things. It's true in my own case. I, I mean, there was a great efflorescence at, at La Trobe University when I was there. And I was part of a, uh, a, a, a very dynamic and very interesting um, informal intellectual milieu um, who I remain in contact with and have done so with many of the participants in that milieu over a very long period of time. And, um, you know, they've spread out all over the world and done all those kinds of things. Um, but... And then I asked myself, then using that as an example, uh, what's the key thing to look at? The key thing to ask yourself is what kind of formal or social settings allow those kinds of highly creative and dynamic milieus to proliferate and so on? And I go back and suggest that people actually go and read um, Isaacson's, I think it's Isaacson's book on, on jobs. Uh, and, and Jobs' early life in, in Silicon Valley and, and, and look at the ways in which the, the social place, um, which did include, in fact, you know, garages, but it was part of a social network of sort of semi-dropout, super bright high school kids who were, on, were going to go off and create corporations and technologies and all of those kinds of things. And that's absolutely essential. There's not a formula for doing it, and no government commission is going to produce a report on to tell us how to do it, though, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I, I had actually a similar question, or well, two questions, really, both to do with technology. Yeah. Um, the first one, um, in regards to sort of advances in the physical sciences, do you think the technology necessary to make those advances might be something like a barrier? Like, if you think of... Something like the Higgs boson, the, the amount of money you need to put into creating the equipment to discover that is, is, is huge. Um, yeah. And my, my, second, my second question 
is more directly related to that. Like, you spoke about space. Well, what about sort of cyberspace? Um, and, and I think this changes the quality and experience of space in, in, in very, like, specific ways. So something like free software, the free software movement, we have people sharing ideas and, and, and it's not connected to sort of institutions. It's not connected to, to, to sort of making money. It's purely about the innovation of the piece of software of the code, and it, it's totally uh, democratic. Like, do you, do you see that as, as a sort of potential for new, a, new super, a new star rising in creativity, maybe? Mm. Um, I'm trying to find a way of answering those questions in a short way. Uh, I'm ambivalent about um, cyberspace. Um, I, I spent profitable time uh, working in the late 90s for a very successful internet company and, and um, uh, you know, when I look at back to that experience and I look forward down the last decade or so, I've seen, I have to say, less interesting things coming out of cyberspace than came out of the earlier and, and, and the sort of mid-period of internet development. Why do I think that? I think that because uh, social media has taken over. Social media is a curse that should be banned now, immediately. Um, sorry, I'm showing my age, aren't I? <laughs> That's not good. Um, I think that there is... In a, my serious instance of that is, if I look at the psychology of creation, what I find is consistently the personalities who are creative are an interesting mix of, uh, yes, the social together with the antisocial. And you've got to get that mix right, and it would seem to me that I think my reading generally of, of social of developments in, in, in um, you know, cyber developments in the last decade or so leave me less happy with that. And I have to say that the products of that industry are just pretty ordinary. Um, and I think one might read off the products. Um, I'm a great believer you shall be judged by your works, and the works aren't very good. Um, so that's one answer to that. And the other answer, interesting, really interesting question, which is modern physics and, and so on. I also have reservations. You'll be surprised to hear about that as well, and about spending very large amounts of money, and about going searching for obscure particles deep under the surface. This might be in 50 or 100 years the subject of satire, perhaps. <laughs> you know, like the bump science in the 19th century, was it phrenology? It might end up being phren phrenological. I do have some doubts about that. The thing is, because it's science, you cannot disprove it. I cannot go up and make... I never made that statement, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that I, Some doppelganger, some freak doppelganger made that statement. I can't make a statement like that. Because one of the problems of science is if we contrast it with the 19th century here, where you had mechanics institutes all across Victoria, there were hundreds of them, people would actually actively debate science and you could do it. Right now, if you get up and make any statement critical of science whatsoever, immediately they say, you're an incompetent fool, you're not qualified, and go away, and let us get on with raking the money in from the various governments. Um, I don't believe fundamentally, and I think that's pretty clear from the paper, that um, science is fundamentally driven by lots and lots of money. It's not. It's driven by lots and lots of ideas. And um, we are seeing less of those ideas. And I have to say, high-level theoretical physics is in strife. None of its theories are coming, uh, you know, since quantum mechanics, basically, uh, have really worked. And, and I keep up with, you know, the general popular literature. I'm, you know, interested in cosmology. I, I like it. I find it fascinating. I love string theory and stuff like that. But is it really, at the end of the day, ultimately convincing to lay down Mazir? No, it's not. And the endless search for yet another strange particle, I think, is starting to even leave me a little bit weary. Once you get to particle 326, you start to wonder whether this is actually... There is missing from it something that is very sharp and highly delineated. And you go back and read Einstein's, you know, three or four papers, Cree papers, at the turn of the 20th century, and you find something essentially elegant and sharp. 
And ultimately, I think science is an aesthetic discipline like all great disciplines, and the, and, and, and the core of aesthetics is something that's very simple. And I don't see the simplicity in contemporary physics, even though I find it fascinating to, to read as a general reader. And I can't comment beyond being a general reader. But, but it just seems to me to be going down a number of trails that are, are less and less productive. Um, I'm, I'm somewhere between curious and concerned that... Um, yeah. Creativity is seen as a cognitive capacity yeah. and it doesn't really have, um, well, I didn't hear in this um, talk, any ethical or moral or kind of socially harmonising capacity. Um, so seeing that um, our creativity is defined by coming up with a crazy technology, such as a gun, for example, which may not actually be helping societies. Um, so I suppose it comes to this question, is power or growth um, in terms of publications and impact, um, while it's clearly good for particular industry, output, uh, industry applications, is it necessarily good for societies worldwide? And maybe while we're not seeing an outburst or the um, growth that you're talking about in this industrially, uh, industrially um, applied creativity, maybe we are in society seeing some really extraordinary social things such as, for example, um, psychopaths being CEOs, uh, record levels of people experiencing periods of um, living on their own, people living to advanced ages and maybe not necessarily wanting to. Um, I think that there is a lot of creativity happening in the world, but the fact that it can't be immediately or simply applied into industrial um, societies or ethics. Um, is that something you've come grappled with in this? Uh, yes. I, I have mixed feelings about this, to be honest. I, um, I, I, I think at the end of the day, um, the, 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 there is a a moderately clear separation between things creative and things ethical, which I, I'm not suggesting that there's an absolute divide between the two. Um, however, I, as far as I can see, that whatever we bring into the world, right, whatever act of creation we are engaged in, is liable to, at the very least to... Sometimes it has directly maligned characteristics, but often, and I think more interestingly, frequently, it has um, um, unintended consequences. But that's the human condition. And everything we do has unintended consequences. And I have to say that many of the legions of people who declare themselves to be doing good in the world also prosecute upon the world unintended consequences and create horrible outcomes. And you're seeing this, for example, in the United States with the current Obamacare disaster, which is going to have some pretty terrible consequences, let me say, driven by, um, how is it, the proselytism of good intentions. Um, so I think on either side of the coin, it's a very mixed affair and I think one of the things that do characterise, I think, generally creative people is a, a fundamental perception of an understanding irretrievably of how ambivalent the world is. And much of creativity is about bridging between the bits and pieces of that ambivalence. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to introduce an ethical world, but that's kind of separate issue. Well, not a completely separate issue, but it is separable. Oh, thank you, Peter. Just a simple one. Um, you seem to want to argue that at any point in time, yeah. there's a fairly constant proportion of the total population yeah. who will be eminent. But in some of the comments, you've also talked about social milieu and the importance yep. of particular sorts of social milieu and philosophical ideas coming together. How do you actually marry those? They seem a little bit contradictory to me. Yeah, no, it is. There is a tension between the two. I'm aware of that. And um, I have, I, you know, I've got the age in life where I happily live with my contradictions, you know, um, which I think is also another definition of creativity, um, is that some contradictions are not particularly resolvable, um, but oh, I'll have a go at resolving it anyway, um, you know. 
Um, the um, yeah, uh, I, I, the un the underlying right of um, the incidence of of how is it b b creative minds in the population. Um, it, uh, it doesn't appear to me to vary. Um, it, what does vary, though, is uh, the places that encourage uh, those minds, that bring them out. Um, and often they're places, not necessarily where they've grown up, but they're places of destination. Um, that is to say, they reach a certain age, you know, around, I think for me it was about 16, where it was pretty much, I can't stand this place anymore. I'm, I'm leaving, I'm packing my bag. And eventually came to, to Melbourne. Um, and, and I think that that story is pretty typical of the way in which this, this is, is, is bridged, uh, the contradiction is bridged. And the overall larger population, the incidence doesn't vary, uh, about how the incidence is mapped across social space does vary. And clearly, it's, it's very clear that there are intense concentrations of, you know, creative pools of people. Peter, we can follow this up a bit later so we can be brief on this, but your comment about Obamacare just meant that I had to make a comment and raise a question. I mean, it seems to me underpinning a lot of your ideology, and there is a political subtext to it, which you wouldn't deny, is the whole rural populism of the late 18th century, early 19th century, which is a fear of bigness. Big government, big universities, big corporations. And it seems to underpin the kind of theoretical model that you're presenting to us. But along the way, you gave a clip to Keynesian economics. And that shouldn't be left alone, because Keynesian economics did save the Western, and particularly the American government in the 30s. It took a world war to complete the task. But the previous conservative governments, which adopted a totally different economic viewpoint, were taking the American government, down, American society, down the wrong path. And equally, you can correlate that to the Labor Party's response to the, the, the decline in 2007. Now, I'm assuming you're going to disagree with me, but I wanted to put that comment on record. <laughs> I, do, I do want to disagree. With, I, I do. Um, it, it, but I'm glad that politics is not dead in the universities. It's, it's a heartening thing to see. Um, yeah, look, um, I give my due to um, Keynes's um, intellectual abilities. Um, along with that generation of economists that, that I'd indicated in the 1930s. Having said that, I have to say that um, the Keynesianism of the American government of the 1930s, of the Roosevelt government of the 1930s, I just note the empirical fact that um, compared with other um, global economies, the American depression went on much longer than it should have. And, I don't, and, and one is entitled to infer from that what, 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 what one likes. Uh, but there's good reason to think that the American economy could, could have come out of its depression in 1936 or 1937. Um, and there is a school of thought which does attribute that to Keynesian um, e economics or the particular version of that that was practiced by the Roosevelt administration. But again, one of the things that I'm pointing out is the politics of this is that there needs in the universities across the board, I think, to be a lot more discussion going on about these kinds of fundamental matters uh, than I see today and have seen for the last 30 years in the university. So, I mean, that's much more the point than rather than whether one was pro Keynes or whatever. But, but uh, this needs to be discussed more often. Ken, do you want to ask me a question? No, he doesn't want to ask no, you a thing we're, quite. We're closing, okay. Peter. Um, to close, I'd like very much to thank Peter Murphy. Peter, Peter's done, just before we actually clap, Peter. Peter's done what the social sciences should do at its best tonight. It's, he's invited us to think seriously about the world we live in, the institutions we work in, and what we actually do in those institutions. And he's done that with a very um, grave and challenging perspective on the current state of Western, Western universities. And I think for that, we're very much in his debt. Thank you, Peter Murphy. <laughs>